Welcome everyone to Hot Science at Home. So glad you can make it. The Environmental Science Institute at UT Austin is excited to bring you the hottest and coolest and latest advancements in science through Hot Science at Home. And we are very excited to announce the completion of the first three episodes of our new Hot Science TV show. Here's a very short video about the new initiative we'd like to share with you. Welcome, Welcome to season, to season one, one of Hot Science. science. Three, Three episodes, episodes are complete, are complete and, available and available to watch, to watch on, YouTube, on YouTube, as well as, as, our, well website, as our website, hotscience.tv. Thanks to your support of past campaigns, students and science enthusiasts can learn the value of sharks to our oceans, understand how humans may one day soon survive on Mars, and be inspired by the fascinating science of superheroes. Your support has also allowed us to both shoot and edit all 15 episodes of Season 1. Contributions to this campaign will allow us to complete music, animation, graphics, color correction, and sound design for another five episodes. These will include the birth of galaxies and how they form, detecting cancer and who invented the pen that can do it in a matter of seconds, the destructive fury of hurricanes and how we can survive them, the dangers of space trash and how to reduce pollution in Earth's orbit. Incredible mind-reading robots and how they can help us. Because of your donation, each episode of Hot Science comes with colorful learning and activity guides, a perfect companion in the classroom. Help inspire the next generation of scientists and educators by supporting Season 1 of Hot Science. Thank you for watching and enjoy the show. If you're interested in learning more, just Google Hornraiser at UT. All right, well, I am excited. Uh, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Michael Rani, our special guest for this evening. Hi, Michael, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. In fact, I kind of feel like I'm back in Texas, uh, although just virtually. I don't know if I mentioned this, but in the past two years or so, I've crisscrossed the state several times in Texas. So. I have fondness. <laughs> Texas is so big, it's hard to go anywhere and not get <laughs> crisscross the state. We're, we're, in, we're in everybody's way. <laughs> well, let me introduce everybody to Michael. He's in the School of Education at the University of California at Berkeley, where he leads the research reasoning group. Professor Rani's research explores the nature of how we explain things and how we understand things. These things cover a wide range from concepts of physics and biology to abortion, immigration, and as we will talk about tonight, climate change. So, Michael, we've come a long way with climate change. By that, I mean, you know, in terms of understanding it, figuring out what we can do about it. It, it seems like now it's really come down to, in large part, the question of how do we change human behavior so there'll be wide acceptance of climate change? How, is, is that where we are? Yeah, I think that's where I am anyway. I mean, I think that one of the behaviors that I like to foster with my uh, research group is uh, sort of what I call focused learning, uh, which I think is crucial for people to understand and accept global warming. That is really looking at, you know, the fundamental facts um, regarding climate change. And uh, I think a major way to help people uh, improve their understanding of these things is by helping them process great information. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes people are a little lazy, we're cognitively miserly, and we're not always looking for the best information. And when we get there, we don't always process it as well as we might. So what I've done is I've sort of made it my mission to find uh, hunks of information, each of which are less than five minutes in length, that boost people's acceptance and concern about global warming. And uh, so far, we've found 13 different ways uh, to do that, which is kind of exciting. Yeah. Wow. So your research group studies how people obtain scientific information and how they process it. And how do you do this with respect to people's understanding of global warming? Well, one of the things we do is we use a sort of a methodology that I call the sandwich method. It's not unique to me. It's uh, pretty straightforward as a what we call a pretest and post-test design. And so basically the metaphor is that the two slices of bread are kind of like the pre-tests and post-tests, our assessments, and then in between the fixings are basically uh, an intervention that we would generate. And the idea is that if you increase people's acceptance of global warming, they'll accept it more, 
on the post-test than they did on the pre-test, uh, thanks to the intervention. And the interventions usually are good scientific information or just plain facts. And uh, so this is sort of just the basic paradigm, but we also use fancier techniques, uh, you know, the control groups and things like that, but you kind of get the gist of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the sense of what we do from this. Yeah, right on. Research question that you're addressing. So uh, one of the key questions that I think we have is really, uh, you know, what are the most compelling and important germane uh, information hunks that we can offer people when it comes to increasing global warming and, uh, and, and concern about climate change? So we're not just looking at adequate or apt or okay. We're looking at like the best things, the things that, uh, that move the most people in the most ways. Uh, it's kind of our, our key question is, what are those things that move people? Hmm. And what's your team's key findings with regard to global warming in, in this regard? Well, part of the key finding, frankly, is that it works. <laughs> that is that unfortunately, there are some people that think that you people just believe what they want to believe and they're not empiricists. But in fact, when you give good information to people, it, it works. And that's why we have these 13 ways that actually move people along this continuum from uh, less acceptance to more acceptance. Even people who already you know, are pretty strongly accepting of global warming. Uh, one of the ways we uh, use that we won't be chatting about today unless people want to hear about in the Q&A is why you should trust climate scientists, why generally they're trustworthy and you should listen to them. Um, another one that might be interesting that we could chat about later possibly also is uh, sea level rise. So I even calculated a uh, sea level uh, approach to Austin. <laughs> um, but really, the, one of the difficulties is that there are a lot of individual differences, right? So the one particular way is you're going to necessarily float a person, one person's boat, but it'll work for another person and vice versa. So you have to be sort of sensitive to the individual differences that people have. And that's why we've looked at a multiplicity. And today I'll really just be focusing on what I call the big three of these 13 ways, mostly the things, the techniques that move the most people the, the fastest. And, uh, you know, it'll even include, uh, you know, like, as you see here, uh, the big three include um, different ways that we uh, increase people's acceptance and knowledge, um, you know, and, and quite efficiently. So one way you'll see it says 35 words, but really that's just sort of the germ or the gist of what we do. We provide people with a text. It can be like 400 words, 600 words or whatnot. And uh, it basically explains the mechanism of global warming. It turns out that virtually no one knows uh, why we're getting hotter. If you ask a random sample of people on the street, people can't give you an, a good answer about the physical chemistry about that. So we'll talk about that. And then also we have various statistics that are really representative of what's going on in global warming and climate change. And it turns out if you just give people a little quiz and have them fill in the blank with numerical estimates, that that changes people's minds when you give them the feedback. And then we also are gonna use temperature graphs where we just show basically temperature over time uh, from 1880 to today, basically. And we often contrast it with another uh, graph of the stock market and show how that changes over time. So we have a little intervention that I'll chat about uh, that as well. Interesting. Tell us about the 35 words. Are, are you positing that your research shows that this 35 words can make a difference? Yeah, it really does. And it's a uh, Kind of surprising. I mean, the 35 words are much better when you uh, put them in a lot larger text. In fact, I have a haiku even of 13 words uh, that I won't, <laughs> I won't scare you with. <laughs> Basically, folks uh, really don't know uh, the fundamental element of global warming, which is that uh, global warming is basically an extra greenhouse effect on top of the greenhouse effect that already existed before humans started burning stuff. And so it turns out that if we just give people like 400 words that uh, people read about this mechanism, that it really boosts their knowledge. It like can triple their knowledge about uh, global warming or, or even 17 times uh, on some of our samples. Uh, but even better than that, people actually increase their acceptance of global warming because of this information. And here's an example on the screen of the UT Brownsville. I know it's not Brownsville anymore, but we actually ran uh, students in, 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 uh, in classrooms about this. And sure enough, it boosted people's acceptance by about 
And what I mean by that is it sort of reduced their denial of climate change by 20% uh, compared to like perfect acceptance. And that's a very statistically significant effect. And we also embedded, we embed these 35 words and, uh, and others into our five minute videos. We have on our website, How Global Warming Works, which I hope people will go to later. Uh, we have five videos that embed this information. So if you only have time for a one minute video, you might give that to a crazy uncle who only has time for like a cat video. Whereas <laughs> if you have a cousin who's a school teacher, the five minute video might be, might be for her. And I think we may even show uh, like the uh, one minute video later. Uh, and basically it includes these 35 words, which we think are pretty uh, important. And I'll read them for you just to drive them home a little bit. Earth transforms sunlight's visible light energy into infrared light energy, which leaves Earth slowly because it is absorbed by greenhouse gases. When people produce greenhouse gases, energy leaves Earth even more slowly, raising Earth's temperature. And again, this is uh, this and other materials are at haveglobalwarmingworks.org. Uh, but the basic idea is that a lot of people know that heat is somehow being trapped by the planet, but they don't really have a very good sense of what that means. Some people think that, oh, you know, sunlight bounces off the earth and then it gets grabbed by greenhouse gases, but that doesn't really make sense because why wouldn't the greenhouse gases just grab it on the way in? So what's crucial here is that there's a transformation of light. That is that greenhouse gases really don't care about sunlight coming in, but then sunlight is absorbed by earth, like the asphalt, and then it gets radiated back toward outer space but it gets radiated away as infrared light because Earth is much cooler than the sun. So it doesn't radiate visible light, it radiates infrared. And greenhouse gases love to gobble up these uh, infrared rays. And then uh, as people dump more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it gets too toasty. Like uh, we'd be an ice ball if we had no greenhouse effect. But the fact we're building this extra greenhouse effect means that we're getting too hot, that is, the earth, is the earth is retaining the heat too long and it's heating up not only the atmosphere, but the ocean and the, uh, and the, and the earth, the, uh, the ground itself. So this is very useful uh, uh, information for people to have. I didn't even know this when I started the, this line of research. It's remarkable how many people uh, aren't familiar with it, can't articulate it, but what you've provided here is, uh, seems like a well-polished nugget with a proven track record. So very, very interesting. Well, tell us about your next intervention or, or sandwich meat, the representative climate change statistics. You bet. I might actually say that we've replicated these findings. So uh, many times we've shown that like the mechanism works and uh, our statistics, what I'm about to dive in now, because it turns out that a lot of people, if you ask them to actually explain what they think the evidence of, uh, for climate change is, they often draw a blank or it's, it's kind of vague or there's not really a chain in transit like the leg bone connected to the hip bone kind of thing. And so what we thought would be interesting to do is to just give people basic statistical facts. And so we do that. Um, usually what we do is we give people like seven or nine statistics and they fill in the blank. Usually when I give in-person talks, I actually hand out these cards that has like the 35 words on one side and the other side it has like some uh, statistical questions, people fill mm -hmm. in the blanks. And so you see an example here on the, the slide, which is basically um, how much has Earth's uh, green um, uh, methane increased since the year 1750, which is basically the dawn of the industrial age before we started burning things in earnest. So people can fill in the blank, they like, um, you know, circle plus or minus, and then they fill in a number. It turns out that, you know, most people, they might have a sense that we're getting warmer. And since this is a greenhouse gas, it's probably increased. So they might think it's five or 10%. But the real answer is, as you see, 151%. In fact, hmm. this, these are even old data. It's, uh, we're pretty much tripling the amount of methane that's in the, uh, in the atmosphere uh, compared to you know, the year 1750. And so sometimes people say, well, okay, so these statistics, you give them to them, this boosts people's acceptance of global warming, but how do you know that people just, you know, forget about all this the next day, or it's, it's as soon as they turn on the radio and they hear, you know, another point of view about global warming, that all of your efforts are for naught. So in fact, we ran this pretty cool study where we marbled in 
uh, both these representative statistics, like the example here, mm -hmm. as well as a bunch of misleading statistics that are, you know, uh, cherry picked and, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, really causing people to wonder if global warming is going on or if it's, it's uh, that big of a deal or we should be concerned or if it's, it's so large. But when you do marble these in together, it turns out that people can, they can sense the wheat from the chaff that even when you put them together, people still increase their acceptance of global warming because they can kind of juxtapose in their mind these, you know, sort of more representative statistics, which these things is like, oh, wait, why would they tell me that? That doesn't, why would I want to know that kind of fact? Right. So it's sort of surprising that uh, that even together, they, they still have a potent effect. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, now, your, your third lunch meet, what's the deal with the temperature graphs? Yeah, so it turns out that uh, I've sort of realized that if you look at the media, whether it's you know, the, the web, newspaper, papers, things like that, it's really quite rare that you actually just basically see temperature graphs of how temperature has been changing over time. And particularly since 1880, when we got really good measures of you know planetary temperature and so forth. And so we give a, a number, we give graphs to people where we sort of contrast uh, a couple. In this case, you'll be seeing 64 year moving average graphs. So here are a couple right here. And what we do is we present these and we ask people say, are these going up or down or flat? And people usually say, duh, of course these are going up. <laughs> and uh, we say, oh, well, it turns out that one of these is temperature over time, 64 year moving average. And another one is uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the stock market, even adjusted for inflation. And we ask people, can you tell which is which? And the answer is no, they can't. <laughs> and uh, in fact, it's not just uh, regular folks, but we, I, I've even, uh, I first ran this study with uh, uh, people at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Chicago, the Booth School with all their fancy Nobel laureate type folks. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't tell the difference. In fact, they were non-statistically in the wrong direction about, about which is which. <laughs> And one of the nice things about this is that we also find that not only did this increase people's acceptance of global warming, uh, but it worked just as well for conservatives as for liberals. Uh, and that's been true uh, of all of our um, inventions so far. Hmm. Well, this, this is significant to me that this intervention works for both conservatives and liberals. Is this true for all of your interventions? Yeah, so far we haven't found one where we get what would be called polarization, because one of the concerns is that if uh, people think you're trying to game them or give them propaganda or somehow not telling them the full truth, then, you know, they pull back and there's a danger that they'll say, I believe I accept climate change even less because of what you've given right, me. Right. So that would be a kind of polarization, a kind of a backfire effect. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, we find that our interventions float all boats. And uh, one way to think about this is by thinking about a correlation. So you might think that if people were having a backfire effect, we'd have like a negative correlation between how conservative a person is and how much they gain in their acceptance of global warming. Mm -hmm. um, or alternatively, it could be that there's just no relationship at all. That is, that we increase liberals at the same rate that we increase uh, conservatives in terms of their acceptance of global warming due to our interventions. But in fact, the truth is actually slightly better than that. The correlation here is uh, 0.1, R equal 0.1, which actually suggests that, she shows that conservatives actually increase their acceptance of global warming a little bit more than hmm. liberals increase their acceptance of global warming. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've, uh, I can show you some more data about this as well, that kind of looks at political parties uh, if you weren't compelled by that, uh, we actually ran this big study with about 1,100 participants in about 20 different conditions. And we had really tiny interventions, and then we had ones that went up to five minutes. And we were kind of curious to see uh, how people would respond to these. And in this case, we actually, in addition to the sandwich, we actually had like a delayed post-test even later, nine days later. And I won't go too much into the scale. You can just uh, see that all these are positive, which meant that people's acceptance of global warming increased. Um, but the blue data indicate just how much people increased um, immediately after getting the interventions of the different types. 
And you can see that it's not just Democrats that it increased, that Republicans, Independents, Libertarians, Tea Parties, they all went up. And not only that, um, in contrast to some people who might think that this evaporates like it's out of sight, out of mind, and the people aren't changed anymore the next day or something. As you can see in the green data, nine days later, people were really rock solid in terms of their acceptance of global warming, their increased acceptance of global warming. So it's certainly the case that uh, not only do we float all boats, but it seems like there's good longevity to uh, many of the interventions that we provide. That is impressive how lasting that is, that it's not just this immediate effect. And now that I'm away from uh, these researchers, you know, now I, now I backslide into how I thought previously. Very interesting. So try to pull all this together, Michael. I'd like to hear what you think that what we can do as concerned citizens with this knowledge that your group has produced. What's, what's, what's our takeaway? Well, I guess I'd have three takeaways. One is basically uh, uh, founded on findings that it's really very helpful to talk to your friends and family and, and uh, others about uh, climate change, including your legislature and so forth. And so I would suggest that you, you know, provide our website, How Global Warming Works, as fodder to help the discussion go along. Uh, the second thing I would suggest is that you should actually uh, help elect representatives and senators and even presidents and others who will slow uh, the warming of our, of our planet uh, the fastest, that will retard and inhibit global warming as much as possible. And the third thing I would say is on the home front to follow, you know, a lot of suggestions that we get from time to time that reduces your uh, carbon footprint, your family's carbon footprint, even your employer's carbon footprint. Because I think those three ways are, are really, it serves you, on, you know, puts you and the planet on a, on a good path. Thank you very much, Michael. That was uh, really fascinating. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Are, are you ready? For some questions from our audience. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, everybody, start sending in your questions. And while you're writing your questions and, and posting them through our live stream, we want to show you a great video that Michael's team put together to help explain climate change. And the, everything we're showing you is all available on Michael's website, which we'll share with you after the Q&A. You may have heard of global climate change, which is often called global warming. Take a moment to try to explain to yourself how virtually all climate scientists think the Earth is warming. In one study, we asked almost 300 adults in the U.S., and not a single person could accurately explain the mechanism of global warming at a pretty basic level. We'll quickly summarize the mechanism of global climate change. Earth transforms sunlight's visible energy into infrared light, and infrared energy leaves Earth slowly because it's absorbed by greenhouse gases. As people produce more greenhouse gases, energy leaves Earth even more slowly, raising Earth's temperature even more than it has already gone up. Please share this video with others so you can help them understand how global warming works too. Excellent. Well, welcome back, everyone. And thanks for the questions you got posted. Uh, keep them coming. Yeah, so let's start out with uh, our first question comes from NMB2623. And uh, they ask, will individuals accepting climate change and making personal changes have any significant impact on the problem, given the scale of the issue? That's a great question. That's like a, what they used to call the $64,000 question, NMB2623. <laughs> uh, as it uh, turns out, you know, th these are all these sort of questions of scale, right? Um, and so the I think what we're seeing already is that people's choices have already inhibited climate change. That, you know, I haven't calculated this out, but I'm pretty sure that uh, we have way fewer greenhouse gases than we might have been if we were completely unaware that the global warming was going on and therefore we have a less of a warm planet uh, already because of the actions people are ta taking. 
And if you look at, you know, even the IPCC reports, they point out various scenarios and how cool it would be if we can stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius rather than, you know, some more cataclysmic kind of, you know, five degrees Celsius kind of thing, uh, which wouldn't be so good for our children and species and older cells, that kind of thing. So I definitely think that, that it can work in, and in fact, that there's no other game in town, right? Because if we don't do this, who will? <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I, I also like to think of sort of the, the calculus of the global commons that, you know, small actions by seven and a half billion people can actually amount to something quite significant. And that's what it's going to take. Yeah. The next question comes from uh, John Percy, and he almost mirrors exactly what I was thinking. When I was thinking, what question should I ask Michael? And the way he puts it is, how do you address the response to a fact when someone responds with fake news? Um, I was the way I was going to ask it is, what you're really in the what you're really in the business of is getting people information. And so, what happens when you run up against the quote unquote merchants of doubt, whose sole business is to give people disinformation? How do you have you come up against these folks? That's a great question, John. I mean, uh, one of the things I do is I try to unpack the uh, sort of provenance of the information, right? So I'll say, what is it about the methodology that you are claiming is fake news that you object to? You know, is it that this thing never happened and this video has been, you know, sort of, sort of uh, uh, faked? Uh, is it that you don't believe the National Weather Service uh, data about temperatures? Uh, because I run into a bunch of people. In fact, you know, there, there's even uh, relatives of mine who don't or didn't accept global warming. And I've run into people in bowling alleys and things like that. And usually what I try to do is I try to meet them where they are and try to help them to understand. So, for instance, one fellow I was in a bowling alley with said, uh, you know, there were 500 scientists who wrote to the UN and told them that global warming just isn't happening. It's just not true. And I said, yeah, I heard about that. 500 scientists. And of course, I know that these are scientists in quotes, right? Because if you really look who they are, it's not their field or whatnot. And I, but I looked at him, I said, how many scientists do you think there are? And in that moment, he sort of realized that 500 is not a lot of scientists, right? When you consider just how many are in Austin, you know? So what I try to do is I try to have empathy to pe with people, try to understand why they're thinking something is false or fake news, or, or if they come up with some other thing, I try to deconstruct why that thing isn't true. Like there was a fellow on an airplane that said that he thought volcanoes were causing it. So I helped unpack that. Uh, and uh, I think we just useful. Not only that, he didn't have a theory about why all of a sudden volcanoes were more active. <laughs> so I try to meet people where they are and, and move them when I'm individually. And our materials also try to do that, where we try to give them good information that's just very straightforward, not biased. There's no, there's no uh, gaming it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, let me, let me share a little uh, conversation here between Luca and Laura. Luca says, why is climate change political anyway? It should not be a political statement to say, quote, I believe in science, end quote. And Laura comes back with, we need to remove the word believe in science, in, in her opinion. Thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, those are excellent points. Uh, I usually try to, uh, I don't always do it. I even corrected myself once in this video, I was about to say believe, but I usually try to say accept because belief usually has this sort of tinge of faith and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you don't need faith to interpret these data. It's sort of like, you know, I believe there are buses, you know? <laughs> uh, so the first part of the question that, that the couple had, had uh, suggested are really cool. Um, let's see, I'm trying to <laughs> capture what it was now. <laughs> it's off my screen. It was about Paul J facing now. I got one out of two. Oh yeah, why, what, why is climate change political anyway? Thanks for the reminder. So the uh, if you look at historically, uh, 
say Republicans and Democrats, for instance, as proxies, maybe of liberals and conservatives, up until about 1990, they both accepted that global warming was occurring at roughly the same rate. Uh, and then something happened politically, right? And I won't go into the, 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 the details, but you know, one party realized that certain financial elements and certain businesses weren't going to do so well if we really addressed climate change in a dramatic way. Because you know, if fossil fuel, you know, burning is the problem, you know which uh, which industries are the ones that are most involved in doing that or promoting it or suggest we do that on the home front, right? So there was this schism actually that occurred between the political parties where one of them decided no, we can't go with global warming. And that's really the basis of the, the schism today, although it's been exacerbated by a number of uh, codicils and epicycles and things like that. Right on. Our next question comes from uh, Jono Beatles, and he asks, in your research, how much do you focus on the psychology of communication? Do you, do you work with psychologists to find the best ways to communicate with your audience? And uh, I'm going to think you have a good answer to this, Michael, because I think you have about three or four degrees in psychology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Although my first publications were actually in applied physics and material science, and I have an undergraduate degree in microbiology, and I, I, I took a, a bunch of chemistry and so forth. Um, it turns out that uh, in my sorted past, I eventually gravitated towards psychology. And so that is actually what... Uh, one of my majors as well as my uh, master's and doctoral work was in. So uh, that being said, mostly I was a experimental cognitive psychologist and I haven't, I wasn't so oriented toward communication. Although science education has always been a component of my uh, psychology of learning aspects. So uh, I, I definitely work with a bunch of psychologists um, to help with this, my, my, many of my colleagues and kept cognitive scientists more you know, sort of writ large people that are close to psychology, but even in realms of like artificial intelligence, philosophy, and things like that. So in some respects, I've sort of morphed more into a cognitive scientist than a vanilla uh, psychologist. Very good. Um, wow, there's so many good questions. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to take this one from uh, Abra. Ab Abhiram, I uh, apologize if I've butchered your name. What is meant by carbon footprint? Yeah, this is a, a good question. You hear about it bandied about a bit, Abraham. Abraham. <laughs> but um, generally, it's basically how lightly you're living on the planet with respect to the emissions that you are generating. So, for instance, let's say that you uh, were in a uh, sort of a sustenance farmer in Elbonia, and you, you know, had, uh, you didn't even use uh, 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 petroleum powered tractors, you were like having an ox pull your plow, and you didn't have cell phones and no electricity and so forth, your carbon footprint would be pretty small because your lifestyle is not causing you to burn a lot of fossil fuels. On the other hand, if you are flying a private jet all by yourself, uh, you know, for hours and hours, and then you hop into a limousine all by yourself, and uh, you go to a mansion where the air conditioning is blasting and uh, tons of rooms and you're staying there all by yourself, your carbon footprint is giant because the carbon refers to uh, basically two of the most potent uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, which is CH4. So both of those have carbon. That's kind of what carbon uh, part of the carbon footprint mean there are other greenhouse gases uh so it's not just one's carbon but that's sort of where that term took off from great uh tiara asks why is infrared light more damaging than visible light i understand infrared waves are smaller than visible so why would infrared do more damage we're really getting into the mechanism here yeah, so if you actually watch our five-minute video, there are two sentences of fancy science information that explains what makes a greenhouse gas. So it turns out that um, greenhouse gases absorb infrared light because of how they bend and stretch. So Tiara's come up with a good question, like, so 
oxygen is not a greenhouse gas because it's always symmetrical. It's just vibrating like this. So only molecules that can be asymmetrical uh, while they're moving around are greenhouse gases. So even carbon dioxide, get this right, uh, is a uh, is a greenhouse gas because it's not symmetrical. So it's vibrating, but the atoms are different. Whereas carbon dioxide, let's say my head is is a carbon and my fists are the oxygen. You can see that it can it's not always symmetrical. Sometimes it can be like this or that or bend in and bend back. So these different stretches and bendings actually correspond to wavelengths of infrared light. And that's why they're sort of gobbled up. And different molecules have different signatures of infrared light that they gobble up. So I hope that's not overly Baroque, uh, but I found fascinating. And, and virtually no one knows this, uh, that, uh, that molecules uh, have to be asymmetrical to be greenhouse gases. In fact, even NASA's website got that wrong. I was looking at it. <laughs> right. Right. And as you were saying earlier, we need some of this uh, heating from infrared energy and radiation coming off the earth, right? Without it, the planet would be, as you said, an ice ball, right? So we do need some of that. So it's not that infrared itself is damaging. It's just when there's too much of it because it stays in the atmosphere too long is when we're, we're getting into trouble. Right. Like water vapor is a greenhouse gas, uh, but it was one of the ones that got us to this nice toasty planet. Without water vapor and other things, we'd be an ice ball. But the problem is that too much of a good thing is too much. <laughs> yeah. Right. Olga asks, do you have an inference as to why conservatives increased global warming acceptance more than liberals after these interventions? Well, there's kind of a te technical kludgy way to explain that. Part of it is because there are some liberals that are so close to uh, full agreement in global warming. Like if you're already nine at uh, 9.0 on a nine point scale, there's not much room for you to move. So that sometimes conservatives have more room to roam, right? Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, I think the other part of it is, is that it is so surprising to conservatives that the surprise uh, gives them this uh, booster for changing their mind. In fact, in a lot of studies I've run, whether it's on abortion or immigration, um, you know, things like that, that when people are surprised by a statistic that increases their change in uh, understanding about this thing compared to when they're not surprised. You know, so it's like, you know, if you thought that uh, if you knew that that we were almost tripling methane, then that's not going to move you much. Right. But if you th were like, whoa, my, I can't believe that we're so far up that end. Or you know, one of our statistics is that uh, there are only like 25 glaciers left in Glacier National Park. And we started with 150 about 150 years ago. And so, you know, that blows people's minds that we're running out of glaciers. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to combine again here uh, two people's questions that kind of uh, uh, dovetail quite nicely. Anna asks, what inspired your interest in studying these topics? Why did you decide to tackle public perception to uh, climate change? And Chloe asks, what do you enjoy most about the work that you do? Oh, those are sweet questions. Thanks for both of those. Uh, uh, Really what inspired me to do this is because I've studied problem solving and uh, what's called higher cognition, that is thinking and reasoning and those sorts of things uh, for decades. Uh, in fact, I even started studying this when I was an undergraduate to some degree. And it's always fascinated me, but there was a point where I thought, gee, you know, I work at a public university like Jay does and so forth. I thought, you know, how could I best give back to society by what I'm doing. And I thought, well, I study problem solving. I should probably look at like the biggest problem there is. And so I even asked people uh, in surveys, what do you think the biggest problem is? And over time, it just became clear to me that global warming is the biggest problem. You know, I mean, COVID is scary and all that, but you know, we're already past it in some sense, right? Uh, global warming is still here. And so that's what really motivated me to, uh, to dive into it. Um, Getting, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. And now I'm getting the second question again. <laughs> oh, what, what, do you, uh, what do you enjoy most about the work you do? Oh, well, you know, I think the two coolest things about my job are that I can come up with creative experiments that most people would never have thought to do um, and run them. And when you get the data, 
Jay probably feels this way too. Like when you know you're the only person on the planet, you and your students, to know this new truth about the universe, that is like dopamine crazy. You know, it's really jazzes you. Your serotonin shoots up when you know something, and especially if it's cool and interesting, and you know others will find it jazzing as well. And the other thing that I love doing is this. I love sharing information about climate change. I love giving people information. I love these questions. And I, and I, because I think it's both important and it's a way to engage people that I found delightful. Excellent. We've got time for one last question. I apologize. There's so many good questions. This is a, an, an unusual uh, live stream that we have in terms of the number and depth of the questions. But the last one we'll pose to you comes from Megna, who asks, do you think global warming can ever truly be fixed? Or to what extent do you think we can fix it? And we're counting on you, Michael. Are we, are we going to end with a with a hopeful message or not? Well, I actually am quite hopeful. Um, you know, in terms of uh, what it means to fix global warming, there are different measures of that. Uh, in some ways, you know, the planet will fix itself, you know, because what happens in the carbon cycle is eventually this carbon will go into the bottom of the ocean and it'll be pulled out of the, the atmosphere, but we don't want to wait <laughs> for that very long process to take place uh, while it's not so good for, for people and critters and plants and landscapes, right? So uh, we really want to move uh, forward on that. And there are analyses that suggest that if we just uh, put money into the problem that we have been putting into the fossil fuel industry, that we could solve this in a reasonable amount of time. So one measure of that is that uh, the World Bank has shown that humans as a species uh, subsidize the fossil fuel industry to the tune of $5 trillion per year. Um, now that's a lot of money, right? And if you can imagine that uh, global warming, fixing it might cost, I don't know, $125 trillion. It means that if we had, for the past 25 years, had taken this subsidy and plunked it into uh, fixing cl climate change, we could possibly be done by now, right? So these numbers are a little fuzzy, right? Not everyone would agree with the 125 trillion sort of number. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, that uh, we can change even our small actions, but especially our bigger actions to get legislators to uh, cause us to do the right thing as individuals and so forth. Uh, individuals uh, help as well, right? Um, and, you know, there are some pie in the sky ideas that I don't think we have time for, but presumably someday we could conceivably have a, uh, a machine that sucks uh, carbon and other uh, non-symmetrical uh, gases out of the air. But I don't want to wait for that, for that pie in the sky hope. I think we should act now and make things better because we're already seeing the effects of climate change. I know how many days uh, that you've had a ton of 100 day, degree days in Austin. It's changing out here as well. You don't have to look uh, too far to see what's happening around the world. So uh, climate change is here. We really don't have a choice unless we just want to suffer a misery. Uh, we need to go ahead and, and act on it. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take that as the last word that we have no choice but to be optimistic. And so that's a very good reason for being optimistic. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, everybody, for taking part in the conversation. This will be posted for those of you who want to uh, come back and look at it again. If you want more information, you can wait till we post this. You can also go to Dr. Rani's uh, website, howglobalwarmingworks.org and find out all kinds of information and videos of varying lengths that you could share with your Uncle Joe. Michael's not the only one who has an Uncle Joe. All right, <laughs> thanks everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye.